Okay. So, so the first thing I want, oh, I just wanted to give Yasmina a quick introduction um, and welcome her and thank you very much for agreeing to take part in our webinar series this year. Um, Yasmina Seach is a senior principal scientist at, and she works at Pfizer Relax and she works in, as part of the Bioinnovation and Biotherapeutic Center um, here in the Bay Area in South San Francisco in California. She joined at, uh, RINAT in 2004 and she, at her role at RINAT right now is the head of the protein interaction group where she uses complementary biosensor technologies to provide data on multiple projects at all stages of research. So with that introduction, I will pass over to Yasmina, and I would ask that everybody please hold your questions until the end of the webinar, and also if you could please put your telephone on mute to avoid any interference with the audio. Thanks everybody. Yasmina, please take it away. Thank you, Laura, and thank you for attending the webinar today. It should be a lot of fun. I'm really happy to present um, our work here um, at Pfizer using the Proteon Interaction Array System, and I'll be talking about epitope binning. Um, the principles upon which um, the assays are based, though, can be applied to any blocking assay. So this is how I will split my talk up. I will quickly um, provide an overview of the basic setup of the proteon, and then I will discuss uh, why competitive binding assays are interesting to drug discovery, and I'll focus mainly on epitope binning. I will introduce three different assay orientations that can be used, and we term them in tandem, premix, and classical sandwich. And then I will highlight how you can extend the scope of these assays to any type of blocking assay. So the Proteon Interaction Array System is a real-time label-free biosensor using the optical phenomenon of SPR, which, is, which has been widely used in the industry for about two decades, so it's a really proven concept. And this is a cartoon just showing how the SPR detection is incorporated onto the chip um, that is used in the proteon interaction array system. So you'll see that um, a partner is immobilized onto a sensor surface using an alginate matrix on the proteon chip. And then um, the other binding partner is flowed across that and Binding is monitored in real time by the detection of mass, which changes the refractive index sensed at the surface. This change, changes the polarized light, and the detector senses this minute um, change of mass and gives a readout. And um, contrary to um, most SPR instruments that are out there, on the proteon, the prism is incorporated onto the chip rather than in the instrument, so it's fresh each time. This is um, an example of what the readout would look like from the proteon. So what it's doing is it's translating your biological interaction into a response unit in a label-free and real-time mode. So a baseline is established over your immobilized molecule, and you will get a very flat zero response. When you then inject your solution partner, in this case, for example, an antigen over an immobilized antibody, you get an increase in the response unit, and this is called the association phase. As you continue to provide more antigen to the surface, it may saturate the antibody binding site on the surface and then reach an equilibrium, equilibrium or plateau response. And then when you stop flowing the antigen and then switch to the buffer, that interaction will start decaying and that's the beginning of the dissociation phase. And if you leave that dissociation phase for a really long time, dependent upon the um, interaction you're studying, more molecules will fall off, and then you'll get the entire profile. So what you're looking at here is a real-time, label-free K2 
kinetic view of what's going on at the molecular level. So the proteon interaction array has a very unique way of delivering samples. So cartooned on the left here is the actual flow cell configuration that you see on the proteon chip. It has six parallel inje injections that flow in one of two directions, either a vertical direction or a horizontal direction. And these flow paths, therefore, crisscross one another to create this unique six by six interaction array. So the points where the flow paths intersect are shown by these yellow squares. These are called the reaction spots, and there are now 36 of those. And then um, the flow path in either direction that does not intersect with the alternate flow path is called an interspot. And those can be either in the vertical direction or in the horizontal direction. So this unique configuration actually introduces more options for referencing your data. So you can either use a whole channel for referencing. So you would have five ligands immobilized, for example, and one blank or just activated and blocked surface. Or you could use the interspots, which are adjacent to the reaction spots, and that would allow you to use the full 36 spots for actual ligand immobilization thereby increasing the throughput that you can achieve. Similarly, when you want to blank subtract your data, you could either use an injection, a blank buffer injection, which has been traditionally used, or you could use a row or a column, again, taking advantage of, of this six by six array. So, talking about the application of competitive binding, so if you know the KD, the affinity um, of an interacting pair of molecules, that does allow you to characterize them, but only to a point. More important to biology and indeed to drug discovery is how that interaction impacts other interactions, because that can shed light on the functional significance of the interaction in question. So therefore, blocking is key to drug discovery, and having tools that enable us to identify blocking interactions is very important. So why would you want to use a biosensor for competitive binding? Well, really, there are three points that uh, are relevant here. One is the label-free mode, the other is the real-time mode, and the third is the ability to reuse the binding partner that you put on the chip. So if we go through each one in turn, starting with label free. Other methods, such as ELISA, um, require a label to be um, present in order to provide a signal that can be detected later. And labeling can be time consuming, reagent consuming, and it does limit the scope of the assay because you need to find a label that's not going to interfere in other parts of the assay. When you apply competitive binding to epitope binning, the need for labeling becomes a real hindrance because if you have a panel of antibodies, you'll need to distinguish them from one another. So you'd either need to biotinylate one of them, tag it in another way, or maybe reform it, re reformat it into a fab or another fragment in order to distinguish them from one another. So with the real-time aspect of biosensors, the ability to actually um, visualize the entire binding profile does allow you to interpret the competition data. Um, ELISAs and um, tr fret assays, for example, only provide endpoints, so um, you really can't know definitively whether you have over-reported or under-reported the hit. So false positive in ELISA especially in the context of competitive binding, do require that um, a competitive equilibrium has been reached between the premix antigen antibody in the case of epitope binning and the plated antigen. And another thing is that some small molecules may interfere with the fluorescent signals, for example, in FRET, and show up falsely as inhibitors if you're looking for blocking interactions. 
So ELISA and endpoint analyses in general are very prone to false positives or over-reporting the hits. In contrast, they also are prone to under-reporting hits. And the reason here is that because ELISA is an endpoint analysis and relies on multiple wash steps, um, you may miss complexes that have fast off rates because those would have fallen apart and would be washed away during um, the washout step. So the reuse of an immobilized partner is um, a very nice feature of a biosensor. And contrary to ELISA, um, in ELISA, you would need to plate your um, antigen of interest. And it's really a one-shot deal. You just have to use it. And that can actually um, consume a lot of reagent if you have to plate it every single well. So with a biosensor, you have the option of reusing the ligand that you put onto the chip. So there are many ways in which you can orient a competitive binding assay on a biosensor. So if we take the case ABC, where B can bind to A and or C, and partners A and C do not interact directly with one another, any binding partner can be on the chip. So either A, B, or C could be immobilized. You can preform the A plus B complex and then present C or you could preform the BC complex and then present A. The preform complex can either be on the chip or in solution, and A and C can swap roles. So this is a schematic of what I just said, and these are the three different names that we give to these three different assay orientations. So on the left, the in-tandem approach is B is coupled to the sensor, you saturate with A, and then present C. In the premix approach, B has been allowed to bind C in solution, and then you present that preformed complex to A on the chip. In the classical sandwich, B is bound to A on the chip, and then you present C. So in each case, the arrowed interaction provides a yes-no readout for binding. When you do see a signal at the arrowed interaction, you're getting a sandwich complex formed, and therefore it's not being blocked. And if you do not see a binding signal at the arrow in interaction, you're getting a blocked interaction. So in the context of epitope binning, this is how the assay could be oriented. B is now an antigen, and A and C are alternate antibodies. I will now discuss each of these methods in turn as applied to the protein. Let's first talk about the significance of binning. Why do we care about epitope binning a bunch of antibodies? Well, it's the fact that in biotherapeutics, you're much more likely to converge upon a lead candidate if you screen antibodies by their epitopes rather than screen them by affinity. And that's because you can much more easily mature affinity than um, design an epitope. So because there are in place very standard protocols for maturing and engineering an affinity, um, it's much more prudent to try and screen for the right epitope from the start. Binning allows you to discriminate antibodies in a functional context without knowing any residue level detail about the targeted epitope. So that's very nice. And it also allows you to um, identify antibodies that are likely to share a functional characteristic with another antibody if it happened to be binned um, in the same group. This allows you to take one example from each of the bins forward into a lower throughput functional assay, such as a cell-based assay or an in vivo assay. And this therefore allows you to lower the number of hits that you need to pursue. Um, binning is very important when you don't know what the natural binding partner is of the antigen. So sometimes you may raise antibodies against an interesting molecule, but not know what that interesting molecule directly binds to in nature. And therefore, you wouldn't be able to set up a blocking assay. Um, 
but if you could epitope bin a bunch of antibodies, then you would have at your disposal a repertoire of epitopes, and that increases the chance that one of those epitopes uh, may be a functional one. Another significance of binning is that you can identify sandwiching pairs of interaction and use them in other assays, for example, in ELISA. And the last um, item on my list here is for the lawyers. They really like it when you can broaden the claim of a patent. So if you can identify many different epitopes on your antigen, that broadens the scope of your IP claim. So all the examples that I will draw from are taken from this paper we published this year in Analytical Biochemistry, where we looked at blocking assays and compared them on the OPTEP, Proteon, and Vehicle biosensors, and I'll focus only on the Proteon. So in the in tandem assay, as applied to epitope binning, the antigen is immobilized on the sensor. So on the Proteon, you would couple your antigen to the chip, you would then use each of the six lanes to saturate that antigen with a different antibody. And then you would rotate the flow path and compete with another antibody. So this allows you to saturate with six antibodies, rotate, and then compete with those six antibodies. So in order to get a very clean assay, the, ordering, the order of the binding really matters. The saturating antibody must really saturate the antigen on the chip and remain bound such that when you present the competing antibody, it's not exposed to any free antigen on the chip. Another aspect is that while antigen coupling may be economic, it may inactivate your antigen or mask some epitopes. So um, as a complement to a direct coupling, we would recommend that you try an oriented capture if your antigen is paired or has a fusion partner. The in tandem assay provides a very simple format for screening large panels of antibodies. And this is how it would look schematically. So the different colors represent a different antibody that has been used to, to saturate the antigen on the chip going in a vertical direction. Then when you rotate the chip and compete with that same set of antibodies, you're now providing a six by six matrix of 36 interactions. And the cool thing about the proteome is that in a single injection, you can address these 36 pairs of antibody interactions without any regeneration. And along the diagonal, if you compete with the same six antibodies that you saturated with, Along the diagonal, you will have six self-block controls. So this is how the data would look from such an assay. So the top panel was performed in the vertical direction. So what you're looking at in A is antigen captured along the entire chip on all spots. And then we've saturated with six different antibodies. And you can see that during the injection, the um, um, association phase reaches a plateau level telling us that we have saturated the antigen binding site. However, at the end of the injection, you can see from the arrow that antibody number six is beginning to fall off. So we'll just bear that in mind for later. On the lower panel in red, I've shown here, when you rotate the flow path and then compete with an array of different antibodies, the same six that you saturated with, um, you get different distinct binding profiles. So the numbers one through six um, in yellow are the different saturating antibodies, and then the colors are the different competing antibodies. So you can see by eye that number one and number three in the yellow circles they kind of look the same in that they sandwich with the black and orange lines, which are five and six, but they seem to be blocked by all the other colors. Similarly, two and four have a pretty much baseline signal, so they're being blocked by everyone. And five and six seem to be similar to one another in that they only really sandwich with the green and the blue lines. So number six, you can see that there's some intermediate binding going on. 
And that's because if you look above at B, number six wasn't saturating very well to begin with. So therefore, when you present any other antibody and also six itself, which should be a very clean baseline, you do indeed see a response. So number six wasn't very good at saturating. So as I just said, one and three kind of look similar to one another, two and four look similar to one another, and five and six look similar to one another. So then we like to corroborate all this data into um, a visual matrix that allows us to um, quickly bin antibodies into groups of like blocking behavior. So what you see here down is the saturating antibody, one through six, and along the top you see the competing antibody, one through six. And we've grouped them here to show that one and three kind of look the same, they profile the same when you have applied different competing antibodies. The number one and three are blocked by one, two, three, and four, but sandwiched with five and six. So this traffic light matrix can be interpreted in that red is no signal, it's being blocked. Green is a signal, it's being sandwiched, therefore it's not blocked. And yellow or amber is unclear, that is an intermediate signal, you're not really sure if it's being blocked or not. So as we just discussed, number six wasn't very good when used as a saturating antibody because it started to fall off. Therefore, it was very poor at blocking itself. But when you apply it as the competing antibody, it works very well. And this goes back to um, the caveat for a clean assay in that the saturating antibody truly should saturate in order for you to get a very clean result. So now let's talk about the premix blocking assay. So those same antibodies were now analyzed in a premix blocking assay. So this involved coupling um, each of six different antibodies to a chip in one direction, rotating the flow path, and then injecting antigens that had been premixed with those same antibodies. So a caveat for a clean assay is that the premixed antibody must be supplied in a large molar excess over the antigen, and the antigen's concentration should be fairly large above the affinity for each of those premixed antigens, antibodies. Sorry. So typically we would use something like 200 nanomolar to ensure that we were above the KD. And the premixed antibodies that give intermediate responses should be titrated into the antigen to verify that they either block or sandwich in a dose-dependent manner. This will improve the confidence in the results. And the premixed antibodies can't cross with the antibodies on the chip. So in any type of layered um, interaction system, you have to check for the cross-reaction of the other binding partner that you assume is not going to cross, but you should always empirically check for that. So these are three examples of the different binding behaviors that we saw on a chip. There were six antibodies coupled. I'm only showing three of them. So the yellow circle tells you what antibody is on the chip. So on the left-hand side, number three is on the chip, and the colors are the premixed antibodies. So the red is no premixed antibody, just antigen alone. So relative to that signal, when you premix an antibody, you either see a signal that is um, bigger than free antigen because you're forming a sandwich complex, so you've kind of got an antibody piggy, piggybacking onto the antigen, therefore increasing the mass that's being detected at the chip, or you get a um, blocked response because that antigen cannot bind the antibody on the chip. So you can see from the left-hand side that the number three coupled to the chip it was able to sandwich on, only with numbers five and six, and that two, three, and four blocked that response. So if you look at the middle panel, number five on the chip, the only one of the antibodies tested that sandwiched was number three, and all the other antibodies blocked. And with number two on the chip, I'm looking now at the right-hand side, all of the antibodies tested gave a response that was lower than the antigen alone. So this tells you that all of those antibodies are blocking number two on the chip. 
So these results corroborate the data that I showed in the in tandem binning. So what we found is that we have three bins emerging. Bin A is numbers one and three, and that has the characteristic that it sandwiches with five and six. So five and six we call bin B because they sandwich with bin A. And then bin C is numbers two and four, and they seem to be universal blockers. So the last assay orientation is the classical sandwich. And this involves coupling six antibodies onto the chip, rotating the flow path, capturing the antigen, and then binding an array of antibodies. So in order for this assay to work, the antigen has to be a monomer. Otherwise, you wouldn't be looking at epitopes. You would just be looking at the other subunit. The antigen can't dissociate rapidly from the antibodies on the chip because otherwise there wouldn't be any antigen left to bind the antibody array that is presented in the last step. If the antibody presented in the sandwiching step always gives no response, you have to question whether that antibody is active. Therefore, you can only really trust the blockers if they sandwich elsewhere in the assay. If they don't, then you should reorient the assay and put the sandwiching antibody on the chip. Again, the solution antibodies can't cross non-specifically with the antibodies on the chip, and you should test this empirically. So this is how um, a typical classical sandwich assay would look on the surface of a proteon. We have six different antibodies coupled to the chip. This is taken from our paper, so the antibody numbers are what appear here. So six different numbers, 11, 8, 17, 12, 18, and 10. These are the antibody numbers, and these are the antibodies that are on the chip. And just by eye, you can look at the different colors. The colors are the sandwiching antibodies. So just by eye, you can see that number 11 and number 17, they only give a baseline response when you give the same antibody that is on the chip. That is what we call a self-sandwich. So number 11, is in black, therefore, when you pr present number 11 over number 11 on the chip, you see a self-sandwich or blocked response. All the other antibodies sandwich. So number 11 and number 17 are similar to one another in that they sandwich with everyone, but not themselves. Similarly, number eight and 10, they mutually block one another, but sandwich with all the other members of the group. And number 12 and 18, they block one another, but they sandwich with everyone else. So you can see now three distinct epitopes. So this assay is really nice on the proteon because of the six by six interaction array. Along the diagonal, you've got six inbuilt controls or self sandwiches. And again, all of these data are generated in a single injection. So if you just look at the time scale here, this was a four minute injection. Basically your assay would be done at this point. So why do we care about this? Well, this matrix just um, summarizes the epitope binning data from the classical sandwich method. So you've got a six by six array, and you can see that there are um, three, three blocking behaviors here. 8 and 10 look similar to one another, 12 and 18 look similar to one another, and 11 and 17 are each unique in that they only block themselves but sandwich with everyone else. So this actually allows us to discern at least four bins from this set of six antibodies. You really do have to exhaust the full pairwise matrix in order to assign bins unambiguously because you can only really resolve the bins based upon the um, antibodies in the test set. And it's quite possible that if you introduce other antibodies into the binning, that you may be able to resolve otherwise similar looking bins. So this particular data set is just a snapshot from a much larger panel of antibodies. And um, the antigen in question was quite small, and we were quite surprised to discover so many antibodies raised to this particular antigen. We didn't realize that it could have offered so many different epitopes. So um, 
why this was important to us is that none of the epitopes seem to correspond to any functional significance at all when tested in a cell-based and indeed an in vivo assay until we identified a bin of antibodies that had unique um, characteristics. And then we actually fell upon an epitope bin that did give some functional characteristics. So that was very important to us, that the binning had allowed us to um, unambiguously identify an epitope without knowing any residue level detail at all. But that epitope was functional. So that's really the power of the epitope binning. So we've spoken about three different assay orientations. And so I just wanted to review how do you know which assay orientation is best suited to your particular blocking application. Well, there are a bunch of factors that you really need to consider. So as we um, discussed, the classical sandwich assay is not amenable to aggregated or multi <coughs> um antigens. So you can't use um, a dimer, for example, in the classical sandwich. Can you couple the ant antigen easily to the chip? This is something that you have to consider if you wanted to do the in tandem method. How many antibodies are you, are you screening? Again, that might dictate which assay orientation you choose to use. Also, how tightly the antibodies bind. Again, in order to saturate cleanly, they'd have to be a fairly high affinity. But if you had weak affinity antibodies, you could still get the assay to work, but you just have to uh, choose the appropriate orientation. Also, depending upon how precious the reagents are, you may want to couple that reagent instead of flow it. And if you obtain intermediate responses, we spoke about ways in which you could um, get some more information on that. So, for example, on a premix assay, you may want to dose dependently add in your antibody to see if you get blocking that increases with dose or sandwiching that increases in dose. And often we find that corroborating data from more than one assay orientation really helps to improve your confidence in the results. So in summary, um, the proteome really can provide valuable information to drug discovery that is above and beyond binding kinetics, which is really the signature role of biosensors, but we really feel that the competitive binding that a biosensor can offer, especially the proteome with its unique crisscrossing flow path and high throughput, really does enable these binning assays. So the proteome has this crisscrossing flow path and parallel injection mode, and it creates this unique 2D matrix. And we really feel that that's well suited to blocking because many of the um, interactions would be very, very difficult and um, 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 tedious to do on a regular serial based flow, flow sensor. So using this um, crisscrossing array, you can really attack the project very, very quickly and in a single injection get a lot of information. So the examples that I showed were drawn from a publication where we compared these with vehicle and they matched up perfectly. But the proteome actually allowed us to get the data much, much faster. So the choice of assay orientation was really dictated by the specifics of the interaction system being studied and not by the biosensor used. So you can really have confidence that the proteome is going to give you reliable information. And as I said, you can extend the scope of these blocking orientations to any blocking mm -hmm. assay, not just epitope binning. For example, you could screen for inhibitors of ligand receptor interactions, you could probe multi-site interactions, you could probe allosteric sites, and much, much more. So lastly, I'd just like to thank two people who contributed a lot to this work, to the published work, Dan Malashok and Alana Pinkerton, who are members of my lab, and then Amisha, who's also a member of my lab, who uses the Proteon fairly regularly, and Arvind and Sharma, who are directors here at RENAP. And um, thank you, and I'd be very, very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Yasmina. That was wonderful. Um, that was really a, a very interesting webinar with lots of excellent data. And um, for, on behalf of Biorad, I would like to thank you very much for presenting the data this morning. Um, so I'll start the questions off. 
Um, Asmina, uh, what's your feeling about antibody production in um, perhaps hybridoma pathways versus phage display? Do you mean in terms of the epitopes or in terms of the antibody content in mixed the mill? Um, more, more to do with the epitope. Do you have a, a greater chance in, in your experience against your target for finding something in, in one of the methods versus the other method or do you try both? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, Laura. Actually, we try both and the reason is um, an epitope has to be immunogenic in order to raise an antibody in the traditional hybridoma setting. Mm -hmm. So you may bias um, only for immunogenic epitopes. A mm -hmm. functional epitope may not be immunogenic. So um, if you go through a naive library approach or a panning approach, there's no requirement that that epitope has to elicit an immune response. You are purely mm -hmm probing for affinity. So often we find complementary epitopes from the two different methods. Oh, that's interesting. Great. And, and, and what are the size of the, the libraries that you generate from the monoclonal versus the phage? Is there a great difference in the, in the number of um, antibodies you have to work with? Again, that's an excellent question, and it really is very antigen dependent. So sometimes um, the hybridoma method only raises maybe five hits. Other times it will raise 5,000 hits. It really depends upon the antigen, how immunogenic it was, um, whether we've used a hapton, whether we used a conjugated method, and also oh. how big the antigen is as well. Okay. Um, okay. With the naive libraries, often there is a dominant clone that comes up um, to kind of like overwhelm the diversity of the library. So in theory, you would have many more hits from a naive library approach because you're just uh, diversifying the sequence. But in reality, only a few dominant clones actually come forward. So they're kind of comparable and very, very dependent upon the antigen. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Um, so I'll, I'll pass it on to the floor now. Did, did anybody else have any questions for Yasmina? I guess everybody's feeling shy today. <laughs> Um, so this webinar is actually going to be available for playback uh, at people's convenience for those who couldn't make it this morning. And, um, and once again, I'd just like to extend my, my warm thanks to Yasmina for taking the time to create such wonderful slides and to present the data to us today. It was really a very exciting webinar. So I oh, thank you ever so much, Ed. So with that, I'd like to close the webinar and thank everyone for their attendance. Um, I do hope to see you all at the, the next webinar, which will be um, later on in July, where we will be um, having our uh, presenter from Australia discuss his work with uh, single-chain fragment libraries. So thank you once again, and goodbye. <laughs>